Orleans Humanist Perspective, presented by the New Orleans Secular Humanist Association, following are a few principles of humanism. We're committed to the use of science and reason for understanding the universe and for solving human problems. We're skeptical of untested claims of knowledge, but we're open to new ideas. We are concerned with securing justice and fairness in society and in ending intolerance and discrimination. We are committed to the total separation of religion and government. We affirm humanism as a realistic alternative to the theologies of despair and the ideologies of violence. We reject the concept of an afterlife and believe in living a full and rewarding life here and now. We value and respect each individual's right to judge and lead their lives according to their own position as long as it's respectful of other people living in a free society. We hope you enjoy today's program and others in the weeks to follow. Good day, folks. Good to see you again. I'm Harry Greenberger, the host of this show, and my guest today is Richard Mayer, who is the owner of the Old Marquet Theater. Uh, but before we get into our discussion, the reason that I have selected theater as a topic for today is because, as you saw in the introduction, uh, we're not counting on an afterlife, so we want to live lives now that are full and satisfying and interesting and enjoyable. And, of course, theater is one of those things that contributes to a good life, which is why we're going to talk about this. But before we talk about theater, I'd like to talk a little bit about you and your background. And I have some material here that says that you discovered your affinity for acting when you were 12 years old and chose theater as an elective course in school. As soon as I got on the, that stage, I thought, this is what I'm supposed to be doing, said Mayor. I took to it instantly, and I haven't stopped since. Now, it, I also read here that you uh, studied theater performance at Tulane University. That's right. Are you a native of New Orleans, or have, tell, tell us something about your background. I was born in New York. I'm actually right north of New York City in a place called Peekskill. It's about 40 miles north of the city, and I lived there until I was 10. Uh, then I moved to San Diego, where I went to high school, so I'm kind of on both coasts. And then I came down to New Orleans in uh, 2005, actually got down here two days before Hurricane Katrina to go to Tulane University. Oh, uh, I see, but you t have no responsibility for the hurricane. Not that I'm aware. All right, and you, you went to Tulane t uh, t for the drama department? Is I that... got a major in theater and a minor in history. All right, so you're, a, you're a, a, a transplant to New Orleans, but you're still here, so I gather you like it. Yeah. Uh, then uh, how, did you, how did you move from being a student of, of theater to being involved in theater? Well, I had just graduated from Tulane, and the economy had just tanked, so no one could find a job anywhere. And uh, I was looking for something to do. I just wanted to make my living doing theater, whatever that was. Um, and at the time, right after I graduated in 2009, I was trying to get on a cruise ship as entertainment. And as that was sort of petering off and not working out, um, my friend who opened up a coffee shop and an art gallery down the street from my theater, she came to me and said, hey, my landlord has this space. He's looking for something that's going to be good for the community. Do you think you could put a theater here? And I don't know my limits. So I was like, yeah, of course I can open up a theater and run it by myself. Uh, so I did. So I seized the opportunity and um, designed the space, built the space out. I had a, a group of friends in the National Comedy Company that's a local comedy troupe. And they helped me out at the beginning. And uh, it, just, it just really took off. It turned out it was something I was pretty good at. All right. Now, the, the, uh, the building which you converted into a theater, uh, had previously been a, a pharmacy, is that right? Yes, it was a drugstore for about 85 years. All right, and that, their sign remained outside the building, mm -hmm. all right? Now, uh, and it was the old Marquet, what, drugstore? Uh, Marquet Drugs is what it was called. All right, but that was not the name of your theater originally. What? Tell us about what happened to your original name. 
So I was originally called the Shadow Box uh, from 2010 to the end of 2014, and um, I named it my Theater for Shadow Box. And then two months later, my landlord put up this beautiful neon sign that said "Mark Hare Drugs" from the drugstore. Uh, and when he put up that big, beautiful neon sign, I was like, oh, you know, I really wish he'd put that up before I named my theater the Shadow Box because I would have named myself after that sign. Uh, a couple years down the line, I was contacted by a group in Columbus that had the federal trademark for the term Shadow Box as it relates to theater. Um, and they wanted to make a hoopla about it. And I was like, you know, I'm going to take this opportunity and name myself after the neon sign and the history of the building. So back in January of this year, we renamed ourselves the Old Marquet Theater mm -hmm. to show that not only have we been around a little while, but we're really trying to tie into the fact that our building has been one of the cornerstones of the neighborhood for over a century, actually. Well, Shadow Box was easier for people to uh, remember and to pronounce. Mm -hmm. Are you saying that someone who had a Shadow Box Theater could prevent people from other parts of the country from using that name? Well, they've got the federal trademark for the term shadow box, yeah. um, which is a tricky situation because a shadow box is actually a type of theater. It's a type of puppetry theater. Um, but they managed to get the trademark for it, so theoretically they could go after anyone who used the term oh. shadow box anywhere. Um, but theoretically you could fight that too. I just didn't want to get into any kind of trouble All with right. that, you know? Okay, so you're the old Marquet. Old Marquet now, moving forward. Uh, all right. now. Uh, I'm going to ask you later to tell us about your season uh, program for mm -hmm. Omar K. But uh, what what I'm really a great deal interested in is the proliferation of local theater, because back in the early days, and at one time I was on the board of directors of Gallery Circle Theater. That's all there was: Le Petit Gallery Circle and the University Theaters. That was it. In recent years, very recent years, local theater has proliferated all over town. Tell us about some of these theaters that you may have some familiarity with and how they came about and what kind of productions they do and just so that our audience knows what's out there. Sure. So we've got a really great sort of small scale theater scene and I'm talking about performances that usually take place in theaters under 200 seats or even a lot smaller than that. My theater is about 80 seats at max. Uh, and this came about after the storm. A couple of people sort of came down who had interest in, uh, in the city. Um, the NOLA project came down right after Hurricane Katrina. Afterwards, actually their first show was going to be right before Katrina. It was interrupted by it. They came back after the storm. They started doing shows um, and they really found they loved the city. They loved the work they could do here. A couple of them were from here. Simultaneous with that, um, the New Orleans Fringe Festival was founded, and that was founded in 2008. And that was kind of when I put it that a lot of people really took notice of the area where my theater's at, the Marigny, and said, oh, there's a lot of really fantastic art going on here. There's a lot of people who want to do the art, and there's a lot of spaces for it. So when I had the opportunity to open up my theater down in the Marigny, I was actually, even just getting in there, even though it was one of the first spaces down in the Marigny, I was really confident that it was the right neighborhood for Let it. Let me say this, in addition to the fact that Marigny has blossomed, mm -hmm. you are on St. Claude Avenue, yeah. which also is, is rapidly becoming like an art center, the St. Claude. So you really are like, I think in the, center of all this development. Do you, is that your, your understanding? Oh yeah, absolutely. There are actually four theaters just on St. Claude Avenue and there's six or seven performance spaces that have theater, not just music performance, but they've got either comedy or opera in the Marigny and Bywater area. So out of the entire city of New Orleans, at least half of the theater spaces are currently down in the Marigny and Bywater. Uh, right. The Always Lounge down the street used to be the Marigny Theater. Um, they were actually the first full-time theater down in the area, but they've been going around for, they've been having shows there under one ownership or another for like 10 years. All right, well now aren't they operating like two theaters there? The, the Always Lounge, they're having, they're having theater there, yeah. and then the Marigny Theater just recently acquired some new management, so that space is going to be two theaters as I understand it. Yeah, they also right. have very adequate lighted parking, mm -hmm. which, you know, some people in New Orleans uh, are not, don't feel comfortable going to that side of Canal Street, but they, but they can. 
and and particularly in your area, there's the parking there that uh, you know that they uh, should be reassured. Mm -hmm. Now, when you say that down St. Claude, there are a number of theaters. Tell us about some of them, and some of them also in 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 Maroney and Bywater. Sure. Uh, so, like you're saying, the Always Lounge is actually two spaces now. So, uh, the Always Lounge in the front is a bar and cabaret space. Um, so, they do cabaret shows, vaudeville type shows. They have a lot of great burlesque and things like that. And they occasionally do some uh, really fantastic full plays up there. They had a wonderful production of Three Penny Opera, which actually happened in the bar space. That was just amazing. And they received ago. awards for that. Yeah, that's right. A lot. They got a lot okay. of accolades. It was a great production. Um, and then in the back space, they've got a proscenium theater, which is you know, a standard, the audience is one part and then the stage is right in front of them. Yes. Uh, Jim Fitzmorris, who was one of my professors at Tulane, he's been a theater cr critic in town. Uh, he and his brother Ryan just took over ownership of the back theater space at the Marigny. Uh -huh. And they just announced a new name. They're calling it the Theater at St. Claude. Oh, the, um, I think that's a mistake. But they should have left it Marigny Theater. But well, that name's jumped around a lot. Well, yeah, I think they're trying to say, <laughs> you know, right. we've got new ownership. Okay. This is new people coming and, in. And have they announced uh, their season yet? Not yet. They're going to be doing that in another couple of weeks. Okay. Well, tell us about some of the others. Sure. So uh, further down the road, you've got uh, me. I'm on the corner. We're on the corner, I should say of St. Rock and St. Claude Avenue. So we're actually at a really nice, busy intersection. We're right across from the old St. Rock Market, which just reopened back up. They had beautiful renovations. And next to the... Uh, the uh, healing Center. The Healing Center. Yeah. Which in itself ha ha draws a, a, a lot of, uh, of activity. Yeah, and the Healing Center has a theater in it, too. It's got Cafe Istanbul, which has music, but it also has uh, comedy shows, plays, musicals. Yes, happen, I, have been, I, have been, I have been to theater uh, there as well. Okay, mm -hmm. I interrupted you. Go ahead. No, no not at all. <laughs> uh, and then further down St. Claude, the New Movement. It's a comedy theater. They do improv comedy primarily. Uh, they just opened up a space in the last year um, down on St. Claude on the 2700 block. So that's about three blocks past uh, past my theater, the old Marquet. So in this like six blocks range of St. Claude Avenue, not only do you have a lot of bars, restaurants, things like that, but you've also got five dedicated theater spaces. So any night of the week you can find a show down there or actually three or four shows. And uh, like you were saying, some of them have dedicated parking lots. So uh, the Marini Theater Always Lounge has a dedicated parking lot. The uh, Healing Center has a dedicated parking lot. and. I know a lot of people are iffy about going down to St. Claude. They, they think of the neighborhood, how it was 20, 30 years ago. Yes. Uh, but, you know, it's one of the most high traffic streets in all of New Orleans or all the state of Louisiana. And I've lived down there. You know, I live in the neighborhood, too. I've never had an incident in five years. My theater, no one who's ever come to my theater, tens of thousands of people, no one's ever had a problem with the neighborhood, you know. So um, I think it's, you know, it's great to come down, come down and visit, see what the neighborhood's going on, because we've got a lot of fantastic things and a lot of really great local artists happening down there. Now, what happens then as you get deeper, like into, into Bywater or far, farther down on St. Claude, there's still more theaters? There are. Uh, there's one space which is currently undergoing some renovations. Um, well, the Mudlark Theater is on the other side of St. Claude. They had a fire last year, unfortunately. They're rebuilding right now. It's a puppet theater. They do some really amazing puppetry. Uh, further down the road is the Backyard Ballroom. They're actually getting their licenses in order. They took a year off to get everything set up. And then in the, uh, in the Marini, a little ways, is the Marini Opera House, which a lot of people have probably oh, yes. heard about. Yes. They just had some great press about their new ballet season that's coming up. The and they Opera have House. a very large ca seating capacity, don't they? Yeah, they just increased their capacity to 200 people. And the Marini does ballet, opera, and a lot of the classic arts. But they also feature some you know, mm. theater when it comes through town. Okay. Now, aside from that part of town, which is you know, on the other side of Canal Street, uh, there are, uh, there's other theater opportunities that were not there before. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, the Civic Theater is now now has not, can accommodate lo local production, uh, and and then there is the Mid City Theater, and the new one that just opened on um, was it Aretha. Uh, it's on Barone Street, actually, right off of Aretha Castle Haley. You're talking about the Ashe Powerhouse, which is owned it, by yes, the Yes, and it is a first-class facility. Oh, yeah, it is with their, uh, with their parking lot. Mm -hmm. uh, now, and I'm sure I'm missing some, but there's still, uh, on the upper side of Canal Street, there are still other theater uh, locations. Mm -hmm. But is it with this proliferation of theaters and 
simultaneous shows because if you look in the Times Picayune on the local theater, there are a number of shows running at the same time. Uh, is this going to be an oversupply that may um, affect the uh, size of audiences? What do you think? Uh, I actually think it has the opposite effect. So if we're all out there doing theater and we're all doing really great work, then that means more people are going to see theater and more people are going to realize how much they enjoy it. And rather than us sharing this little subset of the audience, we're actually going to be introducing more people to theater and the more people are going to come out and see all of our shows. So, you know, there's four theaters within a couple of blocks of my space. Uh, if I do a great show, you see an actor that you really love at my theater, you might say, oh, they're doing another show next week down the street. If you like their show, you're going to be more likely to go and see one of the other theaters. So I don't see us as comp uh, competing with each other because, you know, I'm competing with someone going out and seeing music, someone staying at home and watching Netflix. Anything yes. you can do with your time. I'm not competing for theater audience. I'm competing for every audience. Well, I, I attend many local productions. Generally, the audience appears to be middle age, mostly middle age. What's being done or can anything be done to draw in the younger, the younger people? It comes down to diversity of programming. I, I take a lot of pride in, uh, we've got a really wide variety of shows at the Old Marquet. Not only do we have classics, we just had a great production of Antigone that my, uh, my theater company did that I'm uh -huh. a part of, Lux at Umbra. Um, so that's a classic piece, but we also do original works. We do children's shows. And then after my show, so after Antigone, we had a Beastie Boys burlesque show. Uh -huh. And so that keeps the theater busy, but it also, a Beastie Boys burlesque show obviously doesn't necessarily have a lot of overlap with Antigone, a classic okay. replay. But I'll get a lot of young people who n normally don't go and see theater, they'll come out and see a burlesque show, they'll come out and see a comedy show, and they'll say, oh, I had a great time at this space, I'm gonna come back and check out something else. So I'm going for that younger audience. I want people to come out and just kind of have a nice, easy, fun time and they're going to realize how much they enjoy they going to see theater. To it. Yeah, so it's a little, it's like a, a gateway show that leads them into other All materials. Right. Now, um, I, uh, there was a, an article about you in the Times Picayune last month, and among other things, they listed your, the, the shows you have lined up for the season. Mm -hmm. What are they? Do you need this as a reminder? Or? No, no, I got <laughs> it. I'm uh, currently working on them all right now. So my, uh, the resident production company at the Old Marquet is called Lux at Umbra, which is Latin for uh, light and shadow. And we've got three shows currently scheduled for next year. We're actually going to announce a couple of more at the end of summer. But the ones we've got lined up right now are in September we're having, uh, I'll talk to all of you out here, we're going to be having a festival of new plays. So we're going to get some plays by local authors who haven't been, uh, their shows haven't been brought up yet. That's going to be for two weeks in September. And so these are full shows, or yeah. well, not not just one act shows. No, full, full shows. shows. We're okay. actually taking submissions right now for that. Um, I've okay. got like thirty or forty plays that I'm going to be reading over the next week, which is Very good. much better to have more. Uh, the the only show we have selected out of the three is Errata, which is by Michael Allen Zell. He's a local author, and Errata was actually a novel that he came out with, and he's adapted it for the stage, and that actually got a lot of uh, awards when that came out in novel form. So we're excited to have that. Then in October, we're doing Dr. Faustus by Christopher Marlowe. Uh, he was a, a contemporary of Shakespeare's, so that was written in about 1620 or so was when that first got written. Um, and that is about, uh, it's the classic tale of Faustus, the man who sells his soul to the devil for magical powers. And we're going to be doing that as sort of the prototypical horror story, because Faustus inspired a lot of horror movies and plays and things that mm -hmm. came afterwards. So we're really really taken the Halloween spirit with that one. That's going to be a really fun production. And then the last show this season is by Sarah Roll, who's a, a contemporary playwright. And that's a show called Late, A Cowboy Song. And it's about a, a woman who's not really happy with her relationship and marriage, and more so she's not happy with the lot she's got in life. So she sort of falls in love with a cowboy, who happens to be a woman, named Red. Um, and it's a comedy, and it's kind of weird and offbeat and really sweet and charming and just sort of a lovely play. And that's going to go up in January, right before Mardi Gras. I see. Well, um, regarding the number of theaters and the number of shows being presented, uh, is there an adequate number of performers, of actors, yeah. to fill all of your needs? I think if there's anything that we have a wealth of, it's talent. There's more talent in town than we currently have opportunities, which is a good problem to have unless you're an actor and then you're like, oh, you know, I'm chomping at the bit. Um, but that's what we want to do. So 
anytime we have auditions, anytime there's a casting call, you get an enormous outpouring of talent in this town. And that's not only because we've got this great little theater scene, which keeps people interested when they're down here, but we've also got so much film work that a lot of really talented people who either lived down here previously or they might have been inclined to go to New York or Chicago or LA now see us as a valid uh, alternative. They can come down here and perform and be actors for a living. Uh, so that's really great. We do have an enormous amount of talent. When you, you just said uh, uh, an interesting thing, you said they can do it for a living. Mm -hmm. Uh, my impression, because as you know, I have a friend who is a performer, mm -hmm. is they don't make a whole lot of money. Uh, can, can an actor or performer in New Orleans uh, make enough to live on? If you're just doing stage work, it's tricky, but it's tricky to make your living doing theater anywhere in the world. If you're doing a combination of stage and film, it becomes a lot easier, and we've got a, a couple of fairly prominent actors in town who, uh, who manage to make their living effectively with combination of stage and film work, and obviously uh -huh. the film work is the, is the bulk of that money uh, because it's always gonna be that way. Um, but there are some people who make either a large portion of their income from theater or the entirety of their income. I'm, I'm running the theater is, for instance, my full-time job. So that's what I do for a living. And uh, we've got a, a growing number of people who are able to do that, and that's something that wasn't around 10 years ago. We have many more people who make their living with theater than they did back then. Well, now that New Orleans is quite a, a center for uh, film production, and I'm sure that local people get some parts, I mm -hmm. don't know. What, what do you know about uh, what sort of opportunity there is for local actors getting parts in films that are made here? Do you, uh, do you have any, any awareness of how much of that it takes place? A lot of the smaller roles are cast down here and I don't have an enormous amount of film experience because I'm so busy uh, with the old Marquet that I can't really dedicate myself to uh, pursuing a film career. Um, a lot of the smaller roles are uh, cast down here in New Orleans. Uh, many of the larger roles are still cast in LA or New York or elsewhere and then they fly those featured parts in. Uh, part particularly if there's a lot of commercial work down here which is filmed down here, and they'll just do all of the casting for commercials right here in town, which isn't the most glamorous work, but commercials pay very well, especially if it's a national commercial that runs across the entire country. Um, that really pays very well, so. And, and, an actor or a performer who would like that opportunity, do they have to have an agent to get them the job, or how, how does that happen? It's possible to get the work without an agent. Usually, if you know someone who can tell you, oh, there's a casting for a role, if you've got someone who's working on a production, uh, but getting an agent is really the way to go. The and New Orleans have, does have some talent agents. Yeah, we've got uh, quite a few, actually, talent agents, um, and I've got lots of friends who work with all of them, um, and they seem to get pretty consistent uh, auditions and casting. So, yeah, we've got a couple of uh, very good agents you can pursue. Well, that all sounds very good. Now, we still have a few minutes to go, and uh, I'd like to give you the opportunity to tell our audience anything you'd like to tell them about yourself, your theater, New Orleans theater experience, uh, whatever I may not have already asked you. <laughs> um, I just want people to know there's some really, and I'm, I'm not exaggerating this, there's some world-class theater happening in New Orleans. We get a lot of fantastic performers who, um, uh, my good friend of mine is uh, Bremner Duthie, and he's a classically trained opera singer, and he's performed in my theater, you know, every year, because he lives right down the street from me. But when he's not in New Orleans, he went and he headlined a solo festival in Armenia in front of thousands of people. Uh -huh. And he does enormous shows at the Edinburgh Fringe Festival, and he performs in Paris. And when he's in New Orleans, you can find him at all these little, wonderful, lovely spaces. Um, and we have that kind of amazing talent here. You can go out and just see phenomenal people. Um, Michael Cerverus, who just won the Tony Award for Best Actor in a Musical, uh -huh. he was in a show at my theater uh, last December. Um, so you can come down and to a little theater on St. Claude Avenue, and not only can you see fantastic work, classic pieces, brand new pieces by local authors, you can see some of the best performers, and I'm not exaggerating, some of the best performers in the world. Well, and we should not uh, overlook the university uh, theaters because they produce excellent uh, shows as well. And Tulane, the Tulane Summer Lyric Theater, uh, gets awards for their for their production. Mm -hmm. And we can't leave out Jefferson Parish. The Jefferson Parish, what is it for performing arts? Uh, they put on first class performances 
and as I think most people know, they are now going to be moving into their new facility. Yeah, they just had the uh, grand opening. Which is really first class, I've, you know, what I've read about it. So uh, uh, although we do count on a lot of folks who live in Jefferson coming to mm -hmm. New Orleans to see theater, it works both ways. We can go out to Jefferson Parish and and see some very good theater out there. Yeah, and uh, all the way out on Kenner, Rivertown does some really amazing work too. They do uh, J Pass and uh, Rivertown both have a lot of big, bigger Broadway musicals, more classic shows like that. Um, in New Orleans, all of us small theaters, you know, huge musicals don't fit on a tiny little stage. They, they can, you have to be really clever, and we've had some really good luck with that. Um, so it's sort of two sides of the coin. You can find some really wonderful big Broadway shows big Broadway style shows out in Kenner and uh, in Jefferson. I mean, you can see some of the smaller and I want to say more interesting work. It's not quite the word for it, but uh, more original work with a little bit more variety if you come down to the Marigny and the Bywater. So we've got a huge spectrum of art that you can see, a huge spectrum of theater. Well, uh, the people who locally produce a show and they rent your theater or whatever they do, my understanding, my impression, and my past experience is that it's hard to make money producing local theater. You you know you pay your actors, you rent your theater. Mm -hmm. uh, is that your is that your impression also? It can be really difficult. You have to produce smart. I mean, with producing is effectively running a business, a business for the length of the show. Um, so you've got to be really smart about the way you produce it to keep costs low, to get as many audience members you can in. Um, I've gotten pretty good about producing on a budget, and I try to keep the rates of my theater very low. I really try to take the split of the door that the theater needs to keep the lights on more or less because because I love it when the local people can make money doing their art. One of the, my best experiences ever running the Old Marquet uh, was the first time I paid a performer who had never been paid for their art before and they were just ecstatic that they could do what they love and actually make money on it. Richard, thank you very much for being here and I hope you folks uh, have been uh, inspired to, um, to participate in local theater, uh, and we hope that you will also be uh, watching our show regularly uh, as we try to um, let everyone know that there, there are uh, lots of opportunities to live rewarding lives as secular humanists are dedicated to do.